Hello and welcome to textbook engineering problem. Uh, today we're working out of elementary principles of chemical processes third edition. We're doing a, another viewer request tonight and um, we're doing problem number 4.47. Okay I'll go ahead and read the problem statement. At low to moderate pressures the equilibrium state of the water gas shift reaction Carbon monoxide plus water goes to carbon dioxide plus hydrogen is approximately described by the relation, and then it gives uh, this relation here. Okay, um, this is the equilibrium constant. Okay, where T is the reactor temperature, Ke is the equilibrium constant, is the reaction equilibrium constant, and um, they wrote Y. I, I used X's because I'm just used to using X's for mole fractions. Anyway, um, XI is the mole fraction of species I in the reactor contents at equilibrium. The feed to a batch shift reactor contains 20 mole percent carbon monoxide, 10 percent carbon dioxide, 40 percent water, and the balance and inert gas. The reactor is maintained at T equals 1123, 1,123 Kelvin, okay? Part A, assume a basis of one mole feed and draw and label a flow chart. Carry out a degree of freedom analysis of the reactor based on extensive reaction and use it to prove that you have enough information to calculate the composition of the reaction mixture at equilibrium. Do not uh, do no calculations. Okay, um, so you've just got a reactor, you have a feed, initial condition in the reactor, and then you have um, unknowns in, I marked all the unknowns in red, um, but basically it's um, what all of the molar components are and the ending feed. Okay. Um, so degree of freedom analysis, we do an independent material balance. You could do an independent material balance around, around um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and the inert component, okay? And that is uh, four independent equations. Then we have our process spec, that is one independent equation. And then we have our physical constraints, and that is one more independent equation. How many unknowns do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Okay, so six unknowns, six independent equations, zero degrees of freedom. There you go. Um, then they said to um, carry out a degree of freedom analysis based on extensive reaction. Okay, so we can use the extensive reaction to, um, this is the formula, general formula for the extensive reaction. Um, here's our reaction. Okay, so now we can just write all the equations that we know for the extent of reaction. Here, 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 here. Okay, and then here, but this one doesn't participate, so the extent of reaction is zero, right? Um, I highlighted all the unknowns and labeled them one, two, three, four, five, six as we were going, uh, making all these equations. You can see over here on the right hand side, um, I changed, uh, I just converted um, this into, broke it apart into the unknowns that we have to include N2, okay? And then, um, then we also have our physical constraint here, okay? And then our reaction equilibrium equation, okay? And those seven equations, you'll notice I have seven equation and seven unknowns now. That's because um, I did the degree of freedom analysis slightly different than I did um, this analysis. But I mean, they're basically the same thing, um, just taking into account um, uh, this equation instead. Um, so, yeah. Degree of freedom analysis are kind of arbitrary um, in some ways. So uh, I haven't really used them that much except for as solving problems in this book. Uh, some of it's just kind of, depending on how you look at it, there could be like seven equations or eight equations or nine equations and nine unknowns or seven equations and seven unknowns or six equations and six unknowns. Um, 
depending on how you look at the system. So it's kind of, there's not like a set in stone rule that you have to follow. Um, kind of like, it's not like a mathematical relationship. Um, anyway, yeah. So, so we use them for this book because it kind of helps us see the, the, to see if we can solve the problems. But, uh, in reality, you, you, uh, you just have the physical relationships, and then if there is not a value assigned to some sort of term in the physical relationship that you're looking at, then you'll either have to estimate whatever that term is, or you'll have to find another relationship that also involves that equation or that variable, and then maybe you can calculate what that variable is, or or you will just have to assign whatever that whatever you want that variable variable to be. You can assign it to be that. Okay. And then if you've overspecified, you'll find that um, your variables that you assigned are not matching up to what you assigned later on. Okay. Um, degree of freedom analysis can kind of help you catch some of those things a little bit earlier. That's where it comes in use. Okay. All right. So now we're just going to solve it. We have seven equations and seven unknowns. Okay. Easiest one to solve first is to do a substitution into our um, equilibrium equation. So I substitute in all of these values and solve for the equilibrium constant. Okay, then we use equations six and five to solve um, for N2. Okay, okay, so all of those things are known. Then we'll move on to part B. Calculate the total moles of gas in the reactor at equilibrium. If it takes you more than five seconds, you're missing the point. And then the equilibrium mole fraction of hydrogen in the product. Suggestion, begin by writing expressions for the moles of each species in the product gas in terms of the extent of reaction, and then write expressions for the species mole fractions. Okay, I think I think um, their five-second thing is a little bit of an exaggeration, so don't feel bad if you don't pick it out in five seconds, right? <laughs> um, um, the only way that you could pick that out in five seconds, if you go back and you look at the equation, and you see that on the left side of this equation, you have one mole of carbon monoxide, one mole of oxygen, and then when you have the reaction, you end up with one mole of carbon dioxide and one mole of hydrogen, okay? You'll notice that the reaction, the balanced reaction has two moles on the left and two moles on the right, okay? So when we proceed through this reaction, the number of moles doesn't change, okay? So if you noticed that at the very beginning, good for you, you should know that even though we're progressing through this reaction, um, N1 will always equal N2, okay? That's the only way that I, th I think you would be able to get that in five seconds. Otherwise, you do have to do a little bit of number crunching. You'll notice that I, um, that I went through and I showed you that you could solve it even if that was not the case. Um, you could still um, solve for N2 in this instance. So um, if you... If you went through this route and you solved for what N2 was without doing that, good for you. Um, if you were able to see that you could just calculate what N2 was just by looking at the reaction equation, awesome, good job, you know. Um, but if you don't get it in five seconds, don't beat yourself up. That's totally fine. Okay. Um, okay, so then they say, um, what's the equilibrium mole fraction of hydrogen in the product? Well, um, if we calculate what the extent of reaction is, like like I showed you the first equation that we did, um, I didn't solve this algebraically. Um, you can if you want to. Um, I just I just saw the equation here and I just solved it numerically um, quickly, so I don't have the algebraic um, answer to that equation. But it is solvable algebraically. It would just take me an extra like 30 minutes to solve it algebraically. So I did not want to do that. Um, so this is, this is the answer to that. Anyway, um, once you have these, then these are easily backed out of our, um, equations, um, one, two, three, four, you know, those equations that we had labeled earlier in green. Okay. Um, part C, the reaction is not yet at equilibrium. Okay. So it says, suppose a gas sample is drawn from the reactor and analyzed shortly after startup and the mole fraction of hydrogen is significantly different from the calculated value. Assuming that no calculation mistakes or measurement errors have been made, what is the likely explanation for the discrepancy between the calculated and 
measured hydrogen yields. Okay, so it says, suppose a gas sample is drawn from the reactor and analyzed shortly after startup. Those are the keywords, shortly after startup. Okay, so if it's right after you start up, obviously it's not at steady state yet, right? It has not had time to reach steady state. It has not had time to reach equilibrium. Just because a reaction um, is not at equilibrium um, does not mean that it uh, wants to approach equilibrium very quickly, right? Equilibrium is a thermodynamic value. It says nothing about how quickly it reaches equilibrium, okay? So if you have a reaction equation or if you have a um, reaction equilibrium constant, you say, okay, yeah, maybe in a you know, billion, trillion years, the universe will reach equilibrium, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, some reactions are faster than others. Combustion, very quick to reach equilibrium, right? But only if there's a flame or a spark or some sort of catalyst, right? If you don't have the catalyst, then uh, oxygen and hydrogen could be, you know, sitting right next to each other for quite a long time and never reach equilibrium, you know? Um, so anyway, those, those are some examples. Um, okay. Part D. Okay, so part D, I kind of uh, cheated here. It says to make a whole spreadsheet and do a bunch of values for the spreadsheet and whatever. That is to get you practice using a computer. I'm not going to go through and do the computer problem, um, but you can just as easily figure out the answer to this problem just by looking at the reaction equation. Okay, so, so if you look at the reaction equation, I wrote it down right here. If we're trying to... Um, maximize the yield of hydrogen, then we can examine um, the equilibrium constant. Okay, so here's the mole fraction of hydrogen at equilibrium. This is the equilibrium constant. This is our um, mole fractions of, um, of um, uh, carbon monoxide and water. Okay, so you'll want to maximize this multiplication ratio, you know, so if you have too much carbon monoxide, then your water is going to drop off, right? Um, and vice versa. So you want to have these in equal parts, right? So you want to maximize what this, you know, what these things are together. Okay, so it's probably 50-50 is how you get the maximum. All right, you want to minimize um, the amount of carbon dioxide right? Because that's a product. So if you're able to remove carbon dioxide somehow, um, then, uh, then it will increase your hydrogen, okay? And um, your equilibrium constant. Let's go back up and look at that equation. You can see that the equilibrium constant right here, um, as T goes up, the equilibrium constant goes down, right? Um, so as t goes to infinity, this value becomes 0. Exponent 2 is 0 equals 1. So that would be the lowest value that this could be. And as t approaches 0, this goes to infinity, right? And so then you have infinity times a number here, which would mean infinity. So um, then that would mean that, you know, it would go all the way to a completion at 0, right? Okay, so you would want to get t as low as you could, but then it would be bounded by... Um, how fast do you want the reaction to proceed, right? Because this, the lower the temperature, the slower it will approach equilibrium. And uh, you might not even be able to mix some of these. Um, like water is going to turn solid, right? Or it's going to turn to a liquid at some point and then to a solid at some point, right? So, um, so at some point you're limited by um, like those physical constraints on your reactants, okay? Um, but, uh, you want to get T as low as you can if you don't care about how long it takes to reach equilibrium, um, if you're just trying to maximize the yield, okay? And you want to minimize your carbon dioxide, okay? So anyway, those are your constraints there. You can just find out what that is by looking at, um, your reaction equilibrium constant. So you don't need to worry about... Um, doing the computer thing unless your teacher makes you do it. 
Um, if you come up with a good analysis um, like that, um, you might be able to just look at the equation and figure out like, oh, this is this is the uh, the maximum and minimum that I can uh, yield that I can get with this relationship. Anyway, that's it for problem number 4.47. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'll keep trying to put these out um, each day. If you guys have more requests, just let me know. Um, thanks. Hope you have a good night. Bye.